Okay, but we're not here to talk about aliens, are we? We're talk, uh, we're here to talk about clean code. So, what is clean code? And does it matter? What's your opinion? It's a relative term. For some it may be a clean code, for some it may be an SE. That's right. It's certainly relative. Whatever we thought is clean 10 or 15 years ago, we no longer consider clean <laughs> today. One example is writing comments. Yeah, I think for two or three decades at least, software developers have been taught write comments, write more comments, and suddenly we stopped. Something happened. The great filter. <laughs> Does it matter? Yeah, maintainability. Why is it so important? Exactly. So this little bit of experience that we have in software development, and it's really not much. We're doing it just for about 60 years. If we look at builders, they have thousands of years of experience. We have just 60. But this little bit of experience already tells us that creation of a product takes on only a small amount of time, and then maintaining that product and evolving it is most of the time and most of the effort. So that it's easy to maintain is very important. In clean code and software craftsmanship, we actually say that there are two values of software. The so-called primary value of software and the secondary value of software. And I start with the secondary value of software because that's what most people think first if they ask about the value of software. The secondary value of software is that the software does what the current clients currently need without any bugs, crashes, or delays. I mean, of course, that's how we earn our money today. If we can sell the software, if it satisfies the customer needs, if the customer visits the website and is happy, and so that, that's how we make money. But that's only the secondary value. What is the primary value? The primary value of software is that we can easily change it. That is the primary value of software. Because only if we can change it, we can make sure that the secondary value will also be satisfied in future. The secondary value depends on the primary value not the other way around. And that is why that we can easily change software is the primary value of software. So we as developers have a duty. We have a duty to make sure that we can easily change our software. So let's look into some code. I have the fragility example. You might be knowing it from Robert C. Martin. He has used one of these examples in one of his videos. He just showed you the solution. I will show you the way how you go from the bad source code to the solution. And we'll also discuss a few details about the solution. Certain aspects like um, when should you go for classes, when should you go for objects, and so on. So I'm going to do this in IntelliJ IDEA. Any Eclipse users here? Hands up. I think you should change. <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds funny, but, um, but I don't want to say Eclipse is a bad thing. Eclipse is a good IDE. And if you're working with a lot of languages, not everything is supported. It's screen recording. It's already. And um, but in, for Java and everything on the JVM, IntelliJ IDEA simply is even better. So we set up a new project. Springs. 
too small. And I call it fragility example. Because fragility is one of the problems that we are facing in the maintenance of software. This is the source structure with which IntelliJ IDEA starts. I actually don't like it. I, <coughs> I would change the module settings. I created two directories, production directory and a test directory. Why is it important to keep tests and production code separate? You don't want tests to be deployed? Yes, we don't want the tests to be deployed. And how many solid principles are there? How many solid principles are there? Of course, it's only answerable for those who, who know them. But how many are there? Five? Actually, it's 11. The five um, well-known ones are only the, the most important ones. But um, it's actually a set of 11 principles. And one of these principles talks about the um, package structure and tells you that the package structure should follow the structure of your deployment. Okay, so we have the production code. I now copy the source file. Settings, it's using the wrong JDK. Okay. So that's our source code. Let's walk through it a bit. We are obviously dealing with expenses, with expenses of certain types. Currently, we see in an enome that we have three types, dinners, breakfasts, car rentals, and each expense also has an amount. We have a method print report that takes a list of expenses and Now that's a question for you. Do you think it's a good method? What's wrong with that method? It's right. It's doing too many things. What does it mean um, if it does too many things? How do you tell if it's doing too many things? How many is too many? More than one. More than one. Exactly, more than one is too many. We already had to know about that recently. So, which of the principles for good software architecture actually tells us that more than one is too many? That's right, SRP, the single responsibility principle. Originally, the SRP was written for architecture. Originally, it was only talking about components and maybe classes. But nowadays, 
we apply the SRP on everything that we are doing as software developers. We want that no matter on which level of the system the entity we're talking about is, we want that on its level of abstraction, it's doing only one thing. So that's the single responsibility principle. We know the single responsibility under a different name as well. We know it under the name Unix philosophy. If you look at Unix programs, each of these programs is doing only one thing. So, this method is doing more than one thing. But what are these things that the method is doing that we want to separate out? What are these uh, multiple things? It is calculating the expenses as well as it is printing the expenses. Printing That's the right. Report. It's calculating and printing. So these two things are responsibilities we've identified so far. Maybe during the course of the refactoring, we might be identifying even more. What should we do before we refactor the code? Write the test. Yes, we should write tests. Or at least a good test. How many tests doesn't matter. What's important is the quality of the test. So, in this case, I can't even write a test. Why can't I write a test yet? Because it doesn't compile. It doesn't make sense to write a test for something that doesn't compile, because you can't run it. So, first of all, we have to make it compilable. We see that here the dinner and breakfast symbol are unresolved. And if we go up, we see that someone was very naughty and deleted the package statement. So we have to move the file to the correct package. file is compilable and we can start writing tests. How should we go for writing the tests? Come again. Yes. We create a test class. So I do it manually. test do we want to write? Can we be more specific than unit test? I'm not talking about the framework. I'm going to use JUnit because that's the most popular framework. I no longer think it's the best framework. I've worked with Spock recently. I don't want to go back to JUnit. This is one of my last occasions in which I'm using JUnit. Not saying JUnit is bad. JUnit was more, very important without JUnit. Our knowledge about TDD that we have today is basically historically unthinkable. But what type of test do we want to have for such a legacy code? Functional test. Functional test of a specific kind. Um, we, we call the type of test that I'm going to develop characterization test because it characterizes the existing behavior of existing code. That's the type of test that we are going to develop. Usually, if you're dealing with new code, you're not interested in characterization tests. Because if you're writing new code, you're hopefully doing TDD, which means you simply write functional tests before you implement your production code in order to satisfy your tests. But um, in this case, we're dealing with legacy code. So we have to come up with tests for that. And one of the types of tests you develop, and that's the most popular and most useful one, 
is the characterization test. So that's what we are starting with. Now the question is, how can you test the print report method without changing it? Because that's the challenge. We don't want to change the production code before we have a test. How can you change the code? So how do we test this? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a test that captures standard out. Because standard out is being used here, so we have to use redirection. And luckily there is an API in Java to do that. So in the class system we have this set out method and we can simply pass a new print string to it. And there's a type of stream that can capture any output for later retrieval. That's a byte array output string. That's what we're going to put inside the print string. When we are redirecting, we should actually restore our redirection after we are done with our job. So I should also remember my old output And I should resolve it later. And what's also quite sure is we are going to have to access this um, byte array output stream. So I can introduce a variable for that right away. Now we can start with our characterization test. We need some setup for it, some arrangement. We will need some expenses in a list. So let's start with a dinner for, let's say, 750 rupees. And call print report method. I'm going to disable the redirection. I just want to see this test is running and we're seeing something on the screen. Yeah, we're seeing something and we can even see that whoever wrote this has prepared it very well, this example, for us because it contains bugs that we have to fix as well. You can see that after dinner, 
it probably should some print something else. It should certainly not print the default to string method. It should probably be properly implemented or overridden. And meal over expenses marker. To me, that does not look like the output the user should see. To me, that looks like the name of a variable. So there's probably bugs we're going to have to fix. But um, the test, in principle, is working. And we can start developing the characterization test to have full coverage of the existing code. So we want to know all the points that we can execute. We have a for loop. In theory, if you have a for loop, you have to consider whether you also want a special test that runs if the list that you're iterating over is empty. But whether you're really doing that depends on whether for the empty list there will be a different behavior. In this case, I don't see a different behavior for the empty list, so I don't need a special test for the empty list. The next thing are if statements. And we see that we have this if statement depending on the type. So I know that I need at least a dinner and a breakfast and something else in my expense report in order to cover all branches of this if statement. So now we have the if statement covered. Then we see a switch statement. Very bad. I hate switch statements. And um, but this is already covered. We again have special treatment for dinner and breakfast. But here comes another condition. So we want our test to test around that boundary. We want our test to be on both sides of a condition. So I could choose values like 0 and 10,000, for example, but that's not the values that I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose two other values. I'm going to choose 5,000 and 5,001. Why? Because that's exactly the boundary. If I would just choose random values, I would still characterize my behavior, but my test would not be suited as a regression test. If I move that constant somewhere else and accidentally mess up that constant, if I don't test around the boundaries of that constant, I wouldn't find out that I actually messed up that constant. we have covered these conditions and that's basically all the conditions that are there so we can run the test we see the test is running fine Before I go on, I would actually really know about the quality of my test. So I will run the test with code coverage. It's one of the situations where I think measuring code coverage is very useful. I don't know how well you can see it, but on the side, next to the line numbers, you see green bars. The green bars means these lines have been covered. If I would want to be very orthodox, 
I would even go to the settings of IntelliJ IDEA and change the way how the code coverage was measured. Right now it was done with sampling, and sampling only gives line coverage. But in our case, line coverage would not be sufficient. We would have to go for condition coverage, the branch coverage and condition coverage, because of the multiple conditions in the ternary operator here. But um, I leave that exercise to you. I just um, pretend I've done it and we have full coverage. Now I will need the output of the test run and keep it somewhere so that when I change my code, I can verify that the output of the modified code is identical to the original code. There's also something that you frequently find in characterization tests, that the characterization test actually characterizes the existing behavior and memorizes it somehow and then compares the behavior of the new code with the old code through that memorization. And we use specific tools for that. Do you know how you call the memorized state and the new state? We call them gold and lead. So gold we take as a name for the memorized state. So that's the original state of the application. And the lead is what we generate with our new code. And we want that the lead is identical to the gold. So first we have to generate the gold and actually we already did. I just need to copy this into a string. So that's our goal, and now I can compare the output. test and see if it's run. So we have a comparison failure. I forgot to copy the headline.
Okay, you still have a difference. You let character at the end. And where are these differences coming from? So the objects don't have a two string increment. Those are all different instances in memory though. Yes. And because I um, changed a method call that created an object, the object um, IDs have changed. And um, we have a timestamp in the output. I don't like timestamps. And you can see why. You can't compare. You have to always take extra steps if you want to compare if things contain timestamps. Like my files to have time steps, but I don't like to have FI contents to have time steps. So <clears throat> we'll have to deal with this in some way. How can we deal with the um, object IDs? Any suggestions? We don't want object IDs. Well, we. Let's find. Let's look for solutions without changing the production code because my test is not yet running. I'm still <coughs> on developing my test. I know in real life, of course, we would go and do the two string. But for, for the session to demo what you can do, I want to be overly academic in the approach. Yeah, we can use regexes. That's one possibility. So we can turn our code into a regular expression. And so it doesn't have to be identical, it doesn't just have to follow a certain pattern. That's a possibility. So I'll only do it with the time. If we would keep it for a longer time, I would also do it with the other parts of the date. But for now, I'll just do it with the time. And with the object IDs. There is extra five and six uh, in the object oh, IDs line on lines. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. <coughs> so we've basically been my pair now, saving me a lot of time. I believe pair programming is much faster. Yeah. <coughs> Are there still problems somewhere with the regular expression? Just the disadvantage of regular expressions. Well, I know, but I forgot this one. And that was because I didn't clean up the string when I was inserting it. I should have done that. I've already slowed my down self, uh, my, myself down because I was not cleaning up my code as I was writing it. Mm -hmm. Saw it? So I should have actually written it like this. Then I wouldn't have missed out the first dinner. Right. And you should have scolded me. There's such a big audience and no one told me that I was doing something wrong here. We thought it was intentional. 
Okay, still not matching. Probably extra intel or something again. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. So now we have a running test that can tell us whether we do wrong things in the code. Like for example. Let's change some output just to demonstrate the test is working. And yeah, it breaks. So, with this characterization test, then I can start refactoring. The first refactoring that I want to do is I want to fix the bugs. Because <laughs> at least a few bugs, those bugs that hinder me in my progress. And the first one was that the two string was not implemented, or if it's implemented, was not used. So we can see that the expense is here, but um, we get the object ID, so the two string is not implemented. So let's implement the two string method. Where should I start with the implementation of the two-string method? In the test. In the test, yes, in the test. I should start in the test. I should start with expressing what I expect now. So, for the first dinner, what do we expect? Was 5,000, because I, I think it makes sense for the expense to simply print the amount for now. Maybe we change the trust thing and improve it later, but for now we go for the amount. So it was 5,000, 1,000, five thousand one, one thousand one. 750. And if I run the test now, it of course fails because it changed the expectation. So now, but now I'm ready to enter my red green refactor cycle. I can make tests red by changing the expected behavior, and then I can make my production code green by transforming it, and then I can refactor. It's much nicer. And um, there's another change I would like to make as soon as possible. It's um, getting rid of the date. By splitting the method and splitting the test. So that I have a test that contains the date and I have a test that does not contain the date. Because then I can go back from regular expressions to comparison which will be easier to debug. We've seen how much hassle it is to debug the regular expressions in the test. I mean, I'm sure that someone has written a framework for testing regular expression tests in test cases, but it would be too much time to go out and searching it. Why use it if I can avoid it altogether? So, it's a refactoring where I basically extract everything to the end of the method into a new method.
Ah, I forgot to mark the last two print lines. That's why. And I'll make it static. I'm not a fan of instance methods that actually don't access any fields. For me, that doesn't make sense. Because you want to call it, you have to create an object for nothing. Which means that's another refactoring we can do right away. Make this method static. Rerun the tests. Still green. And now I can access it as a static member. Much nicer. Now I can test this separately <coughs> without the head. By simply duplicating my test. And I remove the first part of the string. And I call print expenses and that should hopefully be green. Here I can go back to comparison. <coughs> Still green, but when I refactor tests, I sometimes don't trust them. You should make them fail first. Yes. So I sabotage my production code. In this case, it wasn't really necessary because um, there's coverage. But I, I want to see it fail, and I see it detects. And we see that it's much better with equals than with the regular expressions. So now let's look into the details of the print expenses because our test setup is basically done. I don't see anything more that we need to test right now because right now what we are going to do is we're not going to add new features for now. We're going to refactor the code. So what refactorings do you suggest? going to make it much nicer. The first thing I want to do is I want to really get rid of that switch statement. The switch statement like this is the antithesis of object-oriented or functional programming. It's the antithesis of polymorphism. What is the consequence of the switch statement? What happens if we add a new type here? We need to 
change the existing code. Exactly. We have to change a lot of other code. And um, if we forget to change that code, how are we going to detect that? In the original version? Very light. We wouldn't have found out because we didn't have tests. That's what we actually call fragile code. So let's have a small break with the code. Let's talk about um, that design smell. So that design smell is fragility. If I change something in one place of the program and something else there in the program starts to misbehave, that is fragility. There are three more design smells which we are dealing with as programmers. Exactly. We're violating the open closed principle because that code needs to be changed in order to be adding a new feature. But when we add new features, we don't want to change, to modify code, we want to um, extend code. And what does the open closed principle say? That's right. Open for extension and closed for modification. This code is not closed for modification, the code cries, please change me, otherwise I'm going to break. So we have to change that aspect of the code. But what are the other design spells? So we had fragility, there are three more. One is rigidity. What's the difference between fragility and rigidity? Um, it will only work when, it, when operations are performed in a particular sequence. It is, the, the structure is, it, it is not flexible. Easy to fail, difficult to change. Um, yes. So let's look at fragility and rigidity because they are very similar. Um, when I have a rigid code, it means if I'm changing something here, I have to change something somewhere else in order to get the code running at all, otherwise it would not build. Whereas fragility means I change something here and the code compiles fine, but when I run it, it behaves wrong. Which means that um, both have basically the same causes, but um, the effect is shown differently. The effect of rigidity is something we experience as developers while we are working with the code, whereas the effect of fragility is something that in the worst case is experienced by the customer, by the user. <laughs> Which means that fragility is even worse than rigidity. That's, by the way, one of the arguments of those people that um, want that we still, in 2015, use statically typed languages. Because the static typing trades fragility into rigidity. What is the counter argument? Unit tests. Because unit tests are another way how to trade fragility into rigidity. Because the unit test, although it's not part of the compilation, it's still part of the construction process of the software. So if you have fragility and then you have unit tests that capture your fragility, you've basically turned fragility into rigidity. What are the other two design smells? Immobility, which means that you can't reuse a feature. For example, if you have a login page, um, for authentication of a user and you're developing a second system and you want to reuse that login page and it doesn't work because everything is so tightly coupled with everything else in the system. That would be immobility. And the last one is viscosity. That is when things simply are slow in the development process. When you develop, making changes is slow, when verifying changes is slow, when your version control system is slow, that's what we call viscosity. Any clear case users here? Hands up? That's good. No clear case users here. 
ah, these two poor guys in the corner, I know, I know them. <laughs> they, they, they have an employer who still uses ClearCase in 2015. I, know if, I don't know if you've ever worked with IBM ClearCase. It's one of the worst version control systems <laughs> ever. It's awfully slow. We had a project with about um, 25,000 files and directories, if I remember correctly. There's nothing big for Git. Let's look at Linux, how big Linux is. Linux has millions of lines of code. That project only had around 850,000 lines of code. And um, when you cl right clicked on a file, because you wanted to see the version tree, like you call Git K. How long does it for Git take for Git K to open? It's instant. When you in that project, when you look at the version tree, you have to wait 15 or 20 minutes until the version tree shows up. That's IBM rational clear case. Don't use it. Use Git, maybe use Mercurial, it's fine. But do you know why such products are still sold? Who buys these products? In short, companies that don't do DevOps. That's a short description of why such things are bought. If the person using it is not the person making the decision, That's how such things get bought. The, the catchphrase here is, no one ever got fired for buying something from IBM. Maybe that's what should have happened. OK, back to the um, design smells. Something more about fragility and rigidity, about that, that difference. It's also related to project management and to effort estimation. When you're dealing with rigidity, it means that the effort of change is high. When you're dealing with fragility, it means that the risk is high. The risk of change is high. And risk can also be translated into effort. Risk is a special variant of effort. Risk is unknown effort. You don't know that it's going to come. And if it's coming, you don't know how much it's going to come. So these are the four design smells. Rigidity, fragility, immobility, and viscosity. What is causing fragility? How can it happen that I make a change in one part of the system and something in another part of the system breaks? There's possible reuse of sharing. Yes, there's a more generic word for that that I'm looking for. It's coupling. Something here can only influence something there if these things are coupled with each other. The same is true for fragility. Rigidity, if I change something here, I have to change something there in order to get it working. It causes coupling. If I change something here and something there breaks, that's also coupling. If I want to use this feature and move it somewhere else, but I can't because it's coupled to that, it's again coupling. So coupling is the main thing about those design smells. And the solid principles that we already mentioned a little bit, like you mentioned the open close principle, and yes, the switch case statement that we are looking at. This is a violation of the open close principle. It's a matter of coupling. The enome and the print expenses are coupled with each other. I can't change the one without changing the other. So these solid principles, they are about managing coupling and cohesion. We want that cohesive things are co-located, and we want that things are decoupled, so that unrelated things stay unrelated. And when I change something here, it doesn't have effect on something else. And that's basically what architecture is about, coupling and cohesion. 
So let's go back to the switch statement and make the suggested change. So we can simply give each of these enum constants constructor parameter with the value to be printed. This is maybe not the best change in the end, but right now it already helps. Why it's not the best change in the end is I do not know the requirements, for example, for internationalization and localization of that application and putting non-constant values or values depending on the locale into an enum constant is probably not a good idea. But for now it's already making the code better, so I go on with that change and we see maybe something interesting is going to that happen to that enum in future. And create a field. And because it's an enum, we, that should be the default behavior whenever you add something to an enum, a field, you always make it final. I also think it's a good idea everywhere else, by the way. And now our expense has a name, and because it's final, we don't really need to make it private for now. And now I can replace this whole code with expense.name. Or expense.type.name. See how many lines I can delete. Suddenly the for loop fits on the screen. Okay, that was a big change. Let's run the tests. Working. Okay, what else could we change? Next suggestion. The, the reason why I wanted to go from this change before the sum up is that this is a change that actually removed one third of the lines and was also easy to make. That's why I wanted to make that change first. Code inside the code loop. Come again. Code inside the code loop. Can move to another method. Um. Yes, but for that we have to. Um, I think it makes sense to do that a little bit lighter. Yeah, we're going to move, do that, but um, there are, we, we got rid of a switch case statement. Why did we get rid of a switch case statement? Because it violates the open close principle. And also here, like, uh, there are multiple responsibilities this method is taking care of. It is also printing yeah. plus it is also calculating. So this is yes, that's definitely something we're going to take care of. So the single responsibility principle violation of performing business logic, calculating the sums, and of the presentation, generating that report, we're going to take care of that. But I first want to get rid of the OCP violations. We still have some. We have two more switch case statements. Well, some, some of you are shaking the head. No, no we haven't. Um, well, they're not written as switch case statements. They're switch case statements in disguise. Ternary operator. Yes, the ternary operator and the if. They're both switch case statements in disguise. I'm not telling every if is a switch case in disguise. I'm not telling every ternary operator is a switch case in disguise. But in this case, they are, because they are switching on the same thing, on the type. Like the switch case was switching on the enum type, of the expense type, 
the if is switching on the enotype, and the question mark colon is switching on the enotype. So let's first get rid of this. How can we get rid of the OCP violation? Maybe we still need the if, but how can we get rid of this type axis? This axis on specific types. Basically, I don't want to see dinner and breakfast as enum constants being used in this method. We can put this in a yeah. Yes, we can move this into an enum. In, into that enum. How can we move this into the enum? Boolean attribute? Yes, a Boolean attribute. How should we call it? Is meal expense. Very good. Is meal expense. <laughs> yeah. We let the Boolean attribute is meal expense. So that's it. Um, I'm, this is also what I'm going to use. I'm just going to revert it to show you something about enums that maybe some of you don't know. I want to show you that. Let's assume we don't go for a, a Boolean attribute. Let's assume we go for a Boolean method. Is meal expense. So let's revert that for now. Did you know that Booleans can contain abstract methods? Yeah. Who already knew that? Hands up. Who already knows that, uh, that enums can contain abstract methods? Hands up. Not so many, but you didn't raise your hands, but you suggested it. <laughs> okay. So you can use template methods in Booleans and then implement them for each of the Booleans. In a way, it's using the lines of code, so is it good? No. No. That's why I'm not going to use it. But I, I use the example also to talk about um, something else. So first of all, now, um, those of you that didn't know it before, know you can put abstract methods in Booleans, and you have to implement it for each of the uh, into enums, and you have to implement it for each of the enum constants in the same way as you would write an um, implementation of a, an anonymous class in Java. Syntax is the same. So the outer braces are for the overriding class, and the container, uh, what it contains are the methods. I don't like this because um, well, it looks so nice because it looks so fancy, it looks so polymorphic. I don't, in general, I'm a fan of polymorphism. But do these methods really show different behavior? Because that is what polymorphism is about. Is returning true in some cases for some of these um, and false for others? Is this really different behavior? Or is it just different values for the same behavior? And I think it's just different values for the same behavior. And if you have different values for the same behavior, what you really have is you have multiple objects of the same class, not multiple classes. That's why um, it's not a good solution. And you can go for the lines of code as a gut feeling. Yeah. Has the same result in most of the cases. This is 
overly complex. So we'll not do that. We keep the booleans like this, much shorter. So now we have a boolean attribute is meal expense. And now that if statement reads much nicer. It's also much more expressive. It tells what we actually want to do. We want to sum up those expenses of meals. So we want to know, are you a meal? What are we going to do with that? With this question mark, colon. Although it is very similar, we can't really reuse is meal expense here, isn't it? Because we need to know whether it's a dinner or whether it's a breakfast. What can we do about that? We can again move it to the inner, just as before. The question just is, what are we going to do with car rental? But um, before I moving this, I first want to fix a bug. Because there's still a bug in the program that we didn't take care of before. Let's run the tests. And I'll show you the bug. That string meal over expense. Meal over expenses marker actually shouldn't be there. What should be there? An X or a space. So that's what should uh, should be there. So let's first fix our tests and so I, here we want a space and a space and a space and an X and an X, right? And the same in the other test. It's actually ugly, isn't it, that I have to change it twice? Although it's the same string. <coughs> I don't want that this happens again. So, I'm going to rename this to expenses code. And turn it into a field. And I should have chosen initialize it with the field declaration. But now I can reuse that expenses code in the other string. So I didn't clean it up. So that duplicate code already had hurt me. Okay, let's run the tests. And um, they should, of course, fail. Let's run this one. This up. So now it expects these spaces or axes. Instead of meal over expenses marker, and then I can remove the. Ah, and someone was very naughty, even made a mistake in the variable name. So now we can run the test again. Yep, 
The reason why I did this now, and I could have done it earlier, but I shouldn't have done it later, because we're going to refactor something that affects whether x or space is printed. Okay, now I can um, refactor this, and I can say that the genome constant has a meal over expense marker uh, amount. Actually, I can, can even better, I can ask the toy, is this amount over your expense? And, um, yeah, we're going to do it this way. It's not the nicest solution. We're going to talk about that then. But um, for now, let's um, ask it. Is meal over expense higher in amount? Return amount greater. <coughs> over expense. And add another enum field over expense. There was 5,000, there was 1,000. What are we going to do with car rental? Let's use zero for now. It's not the solution, it's going to break. But um, our unit tests capture us. The, um, on the Boolean parameters, normally I do not like Boolean parameters being passed into functions. Because when you read that um, function, you don't know what the Boolean means. Let's, for example, assume you have a file open method. And a Boolean decides whether you open the file for reading or for writing. How do you remember? whether true is for reading or whether false is for reading. And no, no chance. Why oh, don't like booleans. But in enum constants, I think differently because there is no problem that I'm using it everywhere. There's only one place where I'm using it, right before the constructor. So there's no going somewhere else in the source code in order to understand the semantics. And it's also not, nothing you use in the code. The only code that uses an enum constructor is the enum itself. So there's no such double take risk. So now we should be able to ask the type. By giving it the expense amount. That should do the same thing. <coughs> and it says there's something wrong. And there's something wrong with the car rental. Well, we entered that zero. So we have to enter something else. <coughs> So what should we enter for car rental? You can use that one. Because that will make sure that the greater condition will always be false. And our test is green. It's not only the for loop that fits on the screen, it's the entire method that fits on the screen. It already got so much better. Well, we have no longer <coughs> big violations of the OCP. There's still small ones, but those small ones we can fix later. 
Um, now I think it's time to take care of the single responsibility principle and move our things into separate methods. So what are the responsibilities that we see in this method? Yeah? But in the inam we are three types of expenses. Two expenses are of me, and one is of car rental. So I am not getting the meaning of that uh, method for is me over expense for car rental. So it is not me. That's a very good point. Um, does a method name is meal over expense make sense for car rental? Doesn't make sense anything. We could change the name into is over expense and say that allows the future extension of um, saying there are also car rentals. We maybe have different sum, maybe 10,000 or 15,000. Would that be okay for you? Yeah, That's a very good uh, point. That will be possible. Yeah, we, we could say that um, we give this implementation for dinner and breakfast, and we use a re implementation that always returns for us for car rental. Would be possible. But um, then, uh, I. The type of uh, amount itself is not now coupled with the, type, uh, uh, the expense amount. Its type is not coupled with the type. Yeah, we could do that, um, but that's a reason why. Now you have the coupling that expense class has the amount, its type, and the enum's third parameter's type has to be same. So tomorrow, if you want to change the amount to big number or something like that, you can't change it. So in other words, like in different scenarios, the expense over expense value can be different in different scenarios. Um, well. The, the, the type itself. But so it's true if I have to change the type, um, but I, I think it's very unlikely that I'm going to change the type. Um, we, the open closed principle is partially a line. Why is it partially a line? In order to follow the open closed principle, I mean, what does it mean? Open for extension and closed for modification. Which means, if you have to make a change to a feature, or if you have to add a feature, you want that you can do the implementation for the change or addition by extending code instead of by modifying code. But in order for your code to be prepared for that, you have to predict the type of change that's going to come. If I don't know what type of change is going to come, I cannot follow the open-closed principle. That is where the open-closed principle also connects very closely to the agile methods. So we are not just talking of solid principles in one corner and agile methods in another corner. They are interrelated with each other. The relationship is that in an agile method we have iterations, like sprints, and in the beginning we have no idea as developers, because we do not know the business domain, what change is going to come. So in the first two or three sprints or iterations, we are learning about what type of change to expect from the customer or client or user or product owner, and then with that information we get a better feeling to forecast what other types of changes are going to come in the future. Of course, the other source of information for that is look at the product backlog. So you're in sprint one, and you're making a change somewhere. If you have already read the product backlog of sprint two and three, what's going to come in future, then making the change will be much easier because you know um, 
the change is going to happen. <coughs> right now, I think the inflation rate in India is low enough to be safe within in Java for quite some time for this expense report. <laughs> so, um, but um, I hope you, you get the point. The point is, um, there's in, in, in the, an abstract fear, a sphere, or in, in the academic sense, you are right. Yeah? We need to consider whether we also have to protect ourselves of the change in time, for example, for the amount. And you're right that I have violated the LCP because I have coupled the is over expense method in a different class into a type that is very specific to one class, expense. I have coupled that. We can never get rid of all these couplings. Um, we will, yeah. There is work for uh, integer max value. Like if we print x, right. so no, it will not. If the value is max itself, no. Oh. Is it greater? Is well thought. We have to take care of such things, but um, there is no bug. But we, we we can test it if you like. <laughs> um, the. In theory, we can protect ourselves from all types of changes. But that does not always make sense. Um, you've already seen what happened to the enum toy when we were not using true and false as a field, but when we were using true and false as a method. Right? It got much more complicated. Abstraction also adds complication to the code. It comes at a cost. Therefore, we want to abstract in those directions where we expect changes. And in those directions where we do not expect changes, we probably don't abstract too much. You can abstract in every direction, and that's called big design upfront. Thanks a lot for your question that gave me an excellent opportunity to talk about that aspect of the open close principle. Thank you. Are you satisfied with my answer? Yeah. Okay. Good, so back to the print expenses. The method is much shorter now. And, um, but it's still too long. And it's violating the SRP. We already discovered this in the beginning. What method should we extract? Can you repeat what you said in the very beginning? Yes, printing and calculation can be separated. So let's look into the for loop. The for loop itself is actually taking three responsibilities. It has the responsibility of calculating the total, it has the responsibility of calculating the real expenses, and it has the responsibility of, cake, uh, of printing. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm simply going to split this for loop into three loops, each loop having one responsibility, and then I can easily extract out things into other methods. Now we have three for loops, and each of these for loops has one responsibility. And um, actually, I don't like braces. I like braces in big methods, but I don't like big methods. And I only like braces in big methods because you need them there. In small methods, you don't need them. So I hope that a lot of braces are also going away. The meal expenses belong here. I also don't like declaring variables at the top of methods. That's ancient stuff from times where compilers were running on machines that had only a few kilobytes of RAM that make sense for the compiler implementers. It doesn't make sense for the users. 
Now I can extract this into a method, get total or sum total, and that can go in a method sum meal expenses. Now here we can make these verbs final. Actually, I don't really need these variables. I can simply inline them. They're just used once. And um, I actually refactor this instead of the other. Because if I'm looking at the name print expenses, that's what the for loop does. It prints the expenses. This is a summary. So I'll extract this into print summary. But print summary shouldn't be in print expenses. Print summary should be in print report. And suddenly a pattern emerges. So we can say print header. Now, doesn't print report look nice? Now that, that's a nice method. And print report now follows the SRP. It is doing just one thing. It's making sure that the elements of the report are printed. And print header is printing the header. Print expenses is printing the expenses. Maybe we can clean up the code a little bit there still. And print summary prints the summary. Here we can still clean it up. Braces. Who needs braces? I, um, ten years ago, I said we have to put braces everywhere, we have to put it straight. Imagine at two at night I'm programming and I'm inserting a line and then it's going to pay just because I forgot that the braces were missing. Today I say, your code should not be in a shape where this could ever happen. So, I remove braces wherever I can. The braces are an opportunity to extract. So, these now look much nicer. We are going to revisit them again, of course, if you read the abstract. I am, of course, showing you Java 8 for each loops. So, I'm going to remove these four statements. Here, ah, I think print expense still does two things. It's looping and it's printing. So we can extract the loop body into a print expense method. Now that's again much nicer, isn't it? Um, what I do not like about, ah, I think it's time to run the tests. We refactor a lot. Oh, and test found something. Yeah. Because, um, the summary is no longer contained in the report. We have to change the test in that case. So we say, whether goal for the summary, that in the other test. 
Now the test should be pass. What I do not like about my code is this line 79. What is it what I don't like about line 79? I have coupled this simple line of code to the structure in the architecture. This simple line of code does not only know that an expense has a type, but it also knows that the type has an attribute is meal expense. And do you know the law that there's a law that we give a name that uh, is violated here? We call it the law of Demeter. This line of code violates the law of Demeter. We also say there's a rule which is the opposite of the law. The rule is say, uh, named tell, don't ask. So instead of asking the expense for the toy and then looking at the toy, are you a meal expense, we should actually ask the expense, are you a meal expense? And then the expense says, I don't know myself, but I don't know. I know who to ask. So it should be tell, don't ask. And um, the law of Demeter says that a method should only access members of the fields of the class, enclosing class, of the parameters, and of any objects it created itself but no more. We are violating the law of Demeter here by not following tail on ask. So I should actually ask the expense. the expense knows this. Now I've decoupled. Now the fragility example class is less coupled to the type. I still have I still have violations here and here. I should also fix them. So I should have something like get name. Do you have to worry about performance if you're doing that? If you're running on a normal Java or VM, no. If you're running on a normal Java VM, for these simple getters, the just-in-time compiler will perform inlining. So if this, well, if it would only matter if this is in the core loop parts of your application anyway. And if it is, it does not matter because the just-in-time compiler is so powerful in optimization that about such things you can really always go for the cleaner code. And if we directly ask the expense, whether it's a this over expense, it's also much simpler here.
So now the type should no longer be used in this class. I think we can also rename this class. What would be a nice name for this class? It's Payne's Report Printer. And um, it should be possible to declare the enum private now. <coughs> and everything should still work. So that the enum is really only known internally to the expense class and nowhere else. Now we see that um, the constructors of expenses are still using it. I think that's okay. Should you keep the enum in the long run? Should the enum stay in the code or should you do something else? Come again, it should be? Outside in what sense? Should it stay in enum or what should happen with it? Should it still be an enum? I think it should not be an enum. I think an interface is also too complicated. But let, let's think about the change that's going to happen. What is the most likely change? It's that we get a new type of expense. Or that something about an expense is changing. Maybe the company says, yeah, now you can spend more on breakfast. It's changing the value from 1,000 to 1,500. Who will be the source of that change? It will be the user. But is it really a new feature that he's demanding? No. These are things that should actually not be in the code at all. What is currently captured as code in the enum class should actually be data in a file. Isn't it? Because that is going to make change very cheap. I mean, whether you give this feature of changing that file to the user, that's something else. That's something the sales people and marketing people have to figure out. Yeah, maybe, maybe they say, oh, it's nice that you made it so cheap, but we're not going to give it to the user. The user has to pay as if it were expensive. Yeah, but that, that's, that's basically one of the things how we as software developers make business by making things which maybe seem like big changes very, very simple. And um, by this enum here, it should actually not be an enum, it should be a class, and the values of the class should be read and initialized from a file. And then you can change the file. Changing a file is much better. We should actually put abstractions in the code, but not data. Data should be somewhere else. Files, database, whatever. So, I think that would be a bit too much for the session if we go for changing that enum. The important part about that is really just the message. The enum should actually not be there. It should be a normal data class that you read from a file. In, in the solution, when you look at what Robert C. Martin did, he actually created a, um, an abstract expense class, and then there was a car rental expense class, and a dinner expense class, and a breakfast expense class, all nicely polymorphic. But the curse of change would still be very high, because when the client comes with a new type of expense, you have to write a new class. If you, could, if we have this enum, 
if the client comes with a new type of expense, you have to add a new constant to the enum. That's already much less. But if you go for a data class and put it in a file or a database, all you have to create is a new record. That's the simplest thing. Okay, so also ah, the Java 8, the for loops I wanted to show. So let's get rid of the for loops. That's really nice. Let's start with some total that's a simpler one. There's a new type of, you, you could say a new type of collection. It's also a member of the Java util package to be in the same package as the other collections, but it's not really a collection. Because a normal collection you can read over and over again, a stream you can read only once. A stream is that new type. And every collection offers you to get a stream. The stream is like an iterator over its elements but it's an iterator that works on itself. You don't need to do it, it does it for you. And um, I have expenses, and what to get is, I want to get the amounts of the expenses as ints. So I call this map to int. And that's a lambda expression. So it's a, you can think of this E is the same thing as this expense, just that I use the short name. And that is just like, like this part here. then I just need the sum. That's it. That's again much shorter, isn't it? And the same thing I can do here. But um, I don't want all expenses. I just want some of them. That's called filtering. So I wrote it as lambda, I'm going to change it. Um, and then the rest is the same. And um, this can be replaced by a method reference. And um, I think with the introduction of Java 8, there are several people who finally think that allowing Java to have the same name for a method and a field was after all not such a good idea. It looked like a good idea for quite some time, but um, now if I would not have, um, if I would not be allowed to have fields and methods with the same names, Method references could be written in a simpler way. I could simply use dot instead of this new colon colon. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm, like always, I'm just accessing a namespace. Why do I suddenly have colon colon for accessing a namespace when it has been dot ever since in Java? It's only because uh, methods and fields can have the same names. So that's how this can be done with Java 8. And um, even this could be done with Java 8.
to have the stream called print expenses, uh, print expense method. That's it. And um, when you do that, you really come closer to functional programming. And that's a nice thing to achieve. Because with funny thing is, you know how old functional programming is? Funny thing is of three paradigms that we are using, the major paradigms, functional programming, object-oriented programming, and structural programming, functional programming is the oldest. It's from 1958, when John McCarthy introduced LISP. And um, object-oriented programming was in the 60s, when people came up with Algol and then made some extensions to Algol and then came up with Simula and then made small talk out of it. And um, structured programming was uh, is actually the youngest of all. It's when Edgar Dijkstra wrote the famous paper "Go to Considered Harmful." And um, functional programming is the youngest to become popular. There seems to be something about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't worry about iterating over the same list multiple times. Um, but May, may I ask you why you worry that we are iterating the same list multiple times? And then I can, iterating can be a one level of abstraction and then all the methods who use iteration inside it, because they are private, they can be, instead of iterating, they can be uh, you know, accepting single object of expense, instead of iterating you know, inside it. Uh, okay. You mean, um, those sum and sub total methods. I guess, uh, but isn't that then the same thing as is uh, as uh, think, uh, getting the amount? See, like uh, example, uh, uh, adding mean and adding expense was kind of the same thing, right? But We were doing addition, but we iterated entire uh, array twice. Even though the you know, thing we were doing was some same. Yes, it's because the the API itself is a with static method, and if it was uh, you know the class, the original one, then we could have uh, have internal variables which represented uh, nil sum or uh, total total. Ah, oh, but. Um isn't it if you are doing the three things in one loop that you actually have to retain state in that loop? So, uh, because our public API was static, we couldn't retain the state, I guess. No, but state is something I would like to avoid if it's not necessary. Because um, state means that um, you have restrictions on concurrency. If I'm worried about performance, um, I can make a few changes in the code. And um, for, for example, I, I can imagine the expenses would be lists of thousands of expenses. I could use a parallel stream if I'm worried about performance. Then Java will take care of um, using multiple threads in parallel to but calculate then, the sum. But then that parallelism will be applied only for this equation. Yeah, that's right. But I can also... And then, that's right, that's a good point. If you, the higher up you start the stream, the more parallelism you get. That, that's right. Uh, 
That's right. Um, basically, at some point, you will have to make trade-offs between different approaches. Yeah, I mean, the, the code, I think this is already quite maintainable. Maybe a few minor improvements can still be made, but it's quite maintainable. Um, There's certainly a way how to keep it maintainable and improve the looping topic. I, I think that's possible. But if, if you if you're keeping if you do it manually, if you keep the state, you certainly cannot use parallelism. Yeah. That's um even though you stream outside, but you will not be able to easily use a parallel stream. You will have to take extra measures to be able to use a parallel stream. Because you will have to take you will have to make sure that the state that you're keeping can be kept for multiple streams in parallel. So I definitely take your, your input and think about this to improve it in terms of parallelism without um, looping on the lower level, how to loop, um, pull the loop up. Currently I don't know how to do it, but I know how to do it by adding fields to the class, turning the static methods into instance methods, and then having the loop outside and keeping the sum and the expense in the class. And that's something I don't want to do. I want to avoid fields that change, I want to avoid variables that change. I want they are rare. Okay, any other questions or inputs? Uh, just a random case from my side. I'll say yeah. uh, I have the enum. So uh, regarding that means uh, the question which I raised earlier, that is over expense. The method is there. So currently we know that it is uh, there for breakfast and dinner, but that was not applicable for car rental. But still we have to implement it for car rental also. So is there not means what we can think in uh, another uh, direction that only means couple of values means I have to write a method only for certain values of the dinner. So how we can approach for that? Um, that as far as you know is not possible. As far as I know, you cannot say that one of these enum constants implements an interface and another doesn't. Maybe I don't know the syntax for it, but um, I, I already tried that and I couldn't find the syntax for that. If you would turn the enum um, into just a normal enum, not a Java enum, which means you would have a class and you would have um, singletons implementing that class, you could do that. Because then you could create your own interface and make what some of them implement that interface and the others wouldn't. But I think the size of the code in this example would not justify it. In other situations, it might justify it. But then you have to write the enum yourself. So whatever the keyword enum is doing as a magic for you, you would have to implement yourself. I mean, there are some languages in which you have a, a parameter to be passed as an option. You don't want to pass it. Yeah. Groovy. <coughs> many others. Yeah. Any other questions or inputs? We should be having the expense calculator as a different class because ex uh, the expense printer uh, is responsible to That's a very good point. Actually, I think um, these static methods, well, they, they could easily be public. There's no harm in making them public. And um, I agree they should actually be, right now they should be in expense. That's currently the best place. 
and if the class expense gets too big, then we would simply make another class expenses with all the utility methods for it. Thank you. That was good input. That makes it even better. There were actually misplaced responsibility. They are not related to printing. They are needed for printing, but they are not related to printing. And uh, on the similar lines, so this particular thing that you are making public uh, can be used as a counter argument for the thing earlier what he proposed, like why uh, for loop, uh, repetition of the for loop. Basically, this is because these are two different can be treated as a different use cases and can be uh, served as a different thing, not in the as a one functionality. So if you just want to know about, about the mean use cases, cases, not the not the sum of total. So yeah, that, that depends on whether the use case yeah. is there or not. Any other input? Do you like the code now? Um, something that I would change is the print report should actually take the stream as an argument. Or maybe we can take the expense report printer and <coughs> turn these methods back into instance methods and construct the expense report printer with the stream as an argument, the output stream as an argument. That would simplify testing significantly because the test code actually is not entirely clean. For example, if an exception is thrown, I do not reset my stream. So there should actually be some cleanup done to the tests as well. What is more important, cleaning up the production code or cleaning up the test code? <laughs> That's of course a good answer. Um, I have shown you the refactoring of the production hub. But um, for me, the test code is more important. Can you guess why? Why do I say the test code is more important than the production code? The test gives you the feedback about the code. Before I'm going to change, make, change my production code, I'll first look into my test and see what they're doing. Uh, and I'll modify the test first. And to modify the test, I'll need to understand the test. Yeah. All, all is right. Yeah. The test is where I start when making a change. And um, if, I, uh, if my tests are hard to change, in order to change my production code. My tests are not fulfilling their purpose. My tests are there to serve me. And um, they will only serve me well if they are also well maintained and easily maintainable. But um, imagine the following scenario. You have two hard disks. One has the production code and one has the test code. And for some reason, the backup system is not working. Which of the hard disks, now you have a hard disk crash, which of the hard disks do you wish was crashed, the production code or the test code? I wish it was the production code that is lost, not the test code. It's much easier to recreate the production code from test code 
than to recreate the test code from production code. Yes. It's yes. Yes. In legacy code, of course, it's different. In legacy code, you have no test. In production code is all you have. So, in legacy code, uh, yeah, the hard disk with a test code will be empty. <laughs> and um, I think there actually are three types of code in our projects. So one is, of course, the production code, the other is the test code. The third type of code is automation code. And I think automation code is the most important code. Also, and it's actually also is the most volume of code that we are using. It's just we're not writing it ourselves. But um, I think the Java compiler has more lines of code than most of our Java projects have. Yeah, so the amount of automation code used in our project is much higher than anything else. And if our automation code fails, everything else depends on it. Imagine there would be a bug in the Java compiler or a bug in the Java virtual machine. It's also our, our automation code. Or there would be a bug in Gradle or Ant or Maven if these things wouldn't be working. Or if there's a bug in your, your scripts and Jenkins is only uploading to AWS every second attempt. That's actually driving you crazy. That's slowing your project down significantly. So I think automation code is the most important code. Then comes the test code. Then comes the production code. Although the production code is that what we are selling, making money with. But in order to do that, we need the other. 